It's her wit. It's just her loving nature. Every single second of every single day to us is frantic because we need to find her. What do you think, Jen? About what? You at the house? Yeah. On January 24, 2006, Jennifer Kessie's family and friends were in a tough spot. They started handing out flyers trying to find any info about Jennifer, who had gone missing the night before or early that morning. Soon, the news went from Orlando to national outlets. Jennifer had a good life, a loving family, a caring boyfriend, and a solid job. No one could figure out why she would just disappear like that. Her disappearance got everyone worried and looking for answers. Even now, more than 17 years later, the idea that something bad happened to Jennifer Kessie is still the main thought. But detectives haven't really figured much out about the case. There's this eerie video with a person who seems important, and they found Jennifer's car. But there's not a lot of clear evidence for the cops to use. It's a mystery. What really went down with Jennifer Kessie in 2006? The puzzle remains unsolved, leaving everyone wondering. Let's dig into this mystery. Jennifer Kessie, just 24 when she disappeared, seemed to be doing really well. She had a steady job as a finance manager at the Central Florida Investments Timeshare Company in Ocoee, Florida. Plus, she was the proud owner of a new condo in Orlando, not far from where she worked. Things were looking up for her. Jennifer and her boyfriend, Robert Allen, even went on a nice vacation to the U.S. Virgin Islands not long before everything changed. Life seemed good and comfortable for her, at least from what everyone could see. On the evening before she vanished, Jennifer Kessie got home from work at about 6 p.m. She had a chat with her family on the phone, and later, around 10 p.m., she called her boyfriend, Robert Allen, before going to bed. Oddly enough, Robert would be the last person close to Jennifer who spoke with her. Normally, Jennifer would send a text or call her boyfriend when she was heading to work. But on the morning of January 24th, nothing came. This got Robert worried, so he tried reaching out to her several times. Sadly, no texts were returned, and his calls went straight to voicemail, adding to the mystery of Jennifer Kessie's disappearance. Jennifer Kessie's co-workers started getting concerned because it was out of the ordinary for her not to get in touch. She hadn't called in, and she even missed a crucial morning meeting. By 11 a.m., her employer got in touch with her parents, letting them know about the unusual situation. Sensing that something wasn't right, Jennifer's parents, Drew and Joyce Kessie, drove from Tampa to Orlando to check if their daughter was at home. The worry among her co-workers and family deepened as the mystery surrounding Jennifer's disappearance continued to unfold. When Jennifer Kessie's parents arrived in Orlando, they noticed her car was gone, but her condo didn't look messed up. They found signs that she had been there that morning. A wet towel, puddles in the shower like she'd washed up before work, pajamas on the floor, and some makeup on the counter. Her mom, mentioning in the podcast unconcluded about the investigation, pointed out that a special pair of pumps Jennifer was excited about was missing from her closet that morning. All these things suggested that Jennifer left for work like any other day. It's worth mentioning, though, that the Orlando police didn't treat Jennifer's condo as a crime scene. So, the big question remained, where was she? The mystery deepened as the search for Jennifer Kesse unfolded. In the time after Jennifer Kesse went missing, the police worked on finding answers, but it's been a tough journey. They did locate her car, but not a whole lot beyond that. Just two days after Jennifer disappeared, someone who saw a picture of her car on the news thought it looked similar to one parked near their apartment. And indeed, it was the same car, a black 2004 Chevy Malibu. This discovery marked a crucial point in the ongoing investigation into Jennifer Kesse's mysterious disappearance. The search for more clues and the truth continued. After closely examining Jennifer Kesse's car at the police crime lab, they only found two bits of physical evidence, a tiny amount of DNA and a fingerprint that was considered too tiny to give any useful info. Oddly, a DVD player of hers was still in the back seat, but things got even more puzzling. Her stuff, 
like her cell phone and purse, were never found, and her bank account showed no activity since she disappeared. Strangely, the police don't think robbery was the reason behind her going missing. Even though they hoped for more clues from the car, the video footage from the apartment complex where her car was found didn't help much either. The lack of clear evidence from both the car and the footage added to the frustration of detectives trying to piece together what happened to Jennifer Kessa. The mystery deepened, leaving more questions than answers. The surveillance video from the apartment complex where Jennifer Kessa's car was discovered caught someone dropping off the car around noon on the day she vanished. But trying to figure out who it was became tricky because the apartment's gate blocked a clear view. The cameras took pictures only every three seconds, not continuously. Coincidentally, at each interval, the person of interest was hidden behind a different part of the gate while walking by. This made it almost impossible to get a good look or any clear details about the suspect's physical appearance. The frustrating limitations of the surveillance footage added another layer of complexity to the investigation into Jennifer Kessie's disappearance. The investigators went all the way to NASA, asking for help to make the video footage clearer. But even with their expertise, they couldn't figure out if the person in the video was a man or woman. All they could tell was that the person was somewhere between 5'3 and 5'5. Journalists who followed the story pointed out that because of the unclear footage, this person of interest became known as the luckiest person of interest ever. The challenge of identifying this mysterious figure added another layer of difficulty to the already puzzling case of Jennifer Kessie's disappearance. And they got their first images of who they believe might have been involved with Jennifer's disappearance. Bo Zimmer, an investigative TV reporter who's covered the case from day one, remembers police being excited by the discovery. It has got to be the most frustrating thing for detectives, the most frustrating thing for the Kessie family, because if, if just one split second later or earlier, you would have seen that individual's face and you would have had a better idea of what happened to Jennifer. With not a lot of physical evidence to work with, investigators started looking into people close to Jennifer Kessie. Both her boyfriend and brother were checked out and ruled out as suspects. Even an ex-boyfriend who wanted to get back together was cleared. Detectives also found out about an older colleague from work who had tried to have a romantic relationship with Jennifer, but they didn't see anything suspicious about him either. Despite the efforts to find leads among those who knew Jennifer, the mystery of her disappearance continued to baffle investigators. Jennifer Kessie had shared with her family that construction workers doing renovations at her complex sometimes catcalled her, but following up on those leads didn't lead to any breakthroughs. Jennifer had told some of her friends that she had felt uncomfortable around some of these guys. Uh, apparently there may have been some cat calls and things like that. I can't help but wonder, was it someone stalking her from afar that she didn't even know? Could there have been someone watching her comings and goings? The police tried talking to as many of the workers who would have been there when Jennifer disappeared, but they acknowledged that they may have missed me. Her credit card stayed untouched after she disappeared, and her cell phone was turned off. The cherished daughter of the Kessie family was missing, and investigators were left without any leads to follow. The mysterious circumstances surrounding Jennifer's disappearance added to the frustration and confusion surrounding the case, leaving everyone searching for answers in the unknown. Imagine waking up and your daughter is nowhere to be found. Orlando Police Day. Teresa Sprague told the Orlando Sentinel on the 10th anniversary of the disappearance. You can't reach her. You can't locate her. The police can't locate her. Hours turn into panic and days into your worst nightmare. I cannot imagine the nightmare the Kessa family has been sleepwalking through for the last 10 years. Police had already interviewed persons of interest, including Jennifer's boyfriend, Ron, who had an airtight alibi. He was more than 200 miles away in Fort Lauderdale at the time of her disappearance. Police have said between his phone records and the fact that he was in South Florida, we don't believe that he was involved. Recently, the Kessie family has been really let down by the Orlando police investigation. They say the police haven't shared much information with them apart from a short two-page document 
there's been minimal contact with the family about how the case is going. Jennifer's father told Fox News, We need to get this information. After 12 years, we deserve that. The family's struggle for more updates and transparency from the police adds another layer of heartache to their ongoing quest for answers in Jennifer Kessie's disappearance. In 2018, the Kessie family took legal action against the Orlando Police Department, seeking more details about Jennifer Kessie's disappearance, as reported by Fox News. Initially, the police asserted that there was no substantial evidence or anything important related to her car, according to Bill Gilmore, Jennifer Kessie's uncle, and the author of the book Aftermath of Jennifer Kessie's Abduction, an uncle's quest for understanding and inspiring life lessons. The family's decision to sue stemmed from their persistent pursuit of information and answers, highlighting their ongoing struggle with the limited communication and transparency from the police in Jennifer's case. But after my sister and brother sued them and got the records from the OPD and had their own team comb through the records, some 15, 18,000 records, it said that they collected DNA in the car, which they originally said that they did not, Gilmore said. That's right, they said today that they want to take Orlando police to court even after police announced today at a news conference they are stepping up efforts in that disappearance case. So we continually investigate this case. Kessie's family stood behind the chief today, but after the news conference, they told us they're frustrated with Orlando police. We are nowhere after 12 years. We are nowhere. Logan Kessie was just 21 years old when his sister disappeared without a trace. Now, he says, the family hired their own private investigator to look into the case, and they're calling on OPD to make their files public. It's a joke. Guys, this is the only reason this is going on is because we are putting pressure on them because we have attorneys involved now. The police also handed over pictures of Jennifer Kess's car that the family hadn't seen before. These images revealed dust from the construction and what seemed like signs of a struggle on the car's hood. Bill Gilmore expressed, We were never aware of that either. So it's just, it's just disheartening. The discovery of previously unseen evidence added to the family's frustration, emphasizing their ongoing challenges in obtaining all the relevant information about Jennifer's disappearance. It honestly, to me, looked like someone was thrown down on the top of the hood, arms spread out, and then dragged back, almost like off the hood, to the point where you can almost see fingers scribbling down the hood. In 2020, Jennifer Kessie's father voiced his belief that she might have been a victim of human trafficking. Two years later, in 2022, he accused the Orlando Police Department of negligence and incompetence in handling the investigation into her disappearance. Jennifer's parents have also seriously considered the possibility that she was kidnapped by sex traffickers, whom Drew says were known to have been working in the Orlando area. My gut feeling to this day, honestly, I, I truly believe she, she is trafficked. So does Jennifer's friend, reporter Scott Thuman. Why isn't that a real possibility? It would make sense on a lot of levels, as unfortunate as it is. That's what leads Jennifer's family to believe she may still be alive. Imagine over that time fighting for unredacted copies with the city's lawyers and trying to have our private investigators find Jennifer from all those files. Then finding out that the lead detective on Jennifer's case did not write a single report or any document since 2010. 12 years, Drew Kessie said, according to News 6 Orlando. We firmly believe the department's negligence and lack of competency cost Jennifer the chance to be found. In November 2022, the Florida Department of Law Enforcement assumed control of the case. By January 2023, the Kessie family posted an update on Jennifer's GoFundMe page, expressing their desire for new DNA testing. They stated, at this point in time and after countless attempts to get authorities to do what is needed to find Jennifer or not, decisively, we believe we have now positioned her case with authorities that are willing, able, and wanting to find Jennifer even after 17 years outside of the Orlando Police Department. With this, we would like to end this video with the hope that you liked and enjoyed it. If you like our content, make sure that you like our video and do share your views and opinions with us in the comment section below.
for anyone please to please help them help find their daughter. Nothing can help. Nothing. nothing. Absolutely, Absolutely nothing. nothing. She's been missing for more than two years. Ten years ago, 12 long years. 13 years later, 14 years.